my name is is Eli Stern. I'm a uh, leader in our in our financial services blockchain practice, and um, I am very excited to be here today with my colleague Andy Magoon and uh, George Throckmorton, uh, client and colleague. We're going to tell you a bit about um, Fixius, uh, a really exciting platform that we're that we're working on uh, with with uh, with uh, Nasha. Um, I will. Uh, I will now uh, hand it off to George to begin talking about um, the, uh, the 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 platform and and how uh, Fix Fixius works. Yeah, thanks, Eli. Um, so I am uh, George Throckmorton, I'm managing director at Nacha. Uh, appreciate the opportunity for uh, uh, my partners over at EY uh, to give me a chance to talk about uh, the project that we're involved in today. Uh, if you don't know Nacha, just real quickly, we are are the steward of the ACH network. Uh, if you don't know the ACH network, potentially, uh, domestically, you'll probably know it by direct deposit. Um, so uh, in the news a lot these days with stimulus payments being made and all of that, that is the network uh, that I work for. So in the financial services industry, what's interesting when we think about shared ledger or blockchain technology, typically we think about payments and moving financial value. Um, but the reality of it is, especially domestically in the U.S., electronic payments work very well. Um, they're very efficient. Um, there are not a lot of errors. They're very quick. All of these things are, are good benefits for electronic payments. However, they do come with some what I would call friction points. And it's really about the data that's being exchanged by the sender and the receiver of electronic payments. And so Nacha um, took it upon itself to... Um, began a project with EY and how we could leverage technology um, along with the rules uh, that Nancha has created uh, for the use of the platform in order to enable a, a broader use of data exchange and one that we're going to talk about does not require bilateral agreements. So on your screen that Andy has now, this is what we aim to do with the platform. Uh, enable secure exchange of payment related information. Andy, could you go back? I, I can't memorize that. Yeah. Uh, payment related information utilizing technology and rules within a network of connected service providers. So that is the elevator pitch for the project. Um, and this is what we've announced to the industry. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is a view uh, of the platform. So it is called Fixius. Uh, Fixius doesn't stand for anything. It's not an acronym, but a name that we created so that we could socialize um, the concept and the platform to the financial services industry. You'll see that on the platform, there are a couple of acronyms, uh, CSP A and B. These are what we call credentialed service providers. These are organizations that connect to the platform. They obviously have a copy of the shared ledger, um, and they are leveraging that in ways that we'll talk about here soon with Andy talking about some flow, a uh, transaction flow with us. Um, but they are providing services downstream to, to businesses who are receiving and sending payments. So the Fixius network is composed of or comprised of the CSPs. Now, who can be a credential service provider is anyone that really has um, uh, fulfilled their requirements to maintain and secure the data in which they will be sharing. So think about a financial institution, think about a large FinTech, um, or think about a large network. And, and networks could be ones that are very commonly known, um, even card networks like Visa and MasterCard, certainly like bottom line, Ariba, there are many of these networks that exist today um, that work very well. So Fixius is not designed to eliminate uh, those other solutions. Instead, it's meant to provide interoperability between them or even those that uh, will be emerging um, in the years to come. So Fixius is really about establishing interoperability. So when you think about that, how do you go about doing that without bilateral agreement? Right, a bilateral agreement would essentially be two companies agreeing to not only the technology they're going to use, but the rules around the data in which they're going to exchange. What kind of data, what are they going to do to protect the data, um, who's going to see and use the data, all of these things are in a bilateral agreement. With Fixius, you eliminate that. Instead of having one-to-one -one bilateral agreements, which in fact is a bilateral agreement, everyone has an agreement with the central authority, which is Fixius, Fixius or Nacho. Um, and so we're all governed by the same set of participant rules around sharing and usage of data. We're all using standardized technology um, so that we can scale quickly 
uh, make changes quickly, um, and really provide that benefit of standardization. So when I talk about interoperability, you can't have it without first establishing trust. So the platform that we are in development with EY first takes a long look at how do we create um, a, a good level of trust through authentication and security with these credentialed service providers. How do we ensure that they have the permission to do what they want to do on the platform, what data they're going to share, and so a lot of effort has been spent towards that technology. I talked briefly about standardization. Standardization for Fixius means in, in one sense that it is standard by we are all using um, the same, um, uh, the same uh, blockchain software, um, all using uh, obviously a copy uh, of that shared ledger. And so again, uh, go, go back Andy. Um, Andy's gonna talk a little bit about how that flow goes. Um, but that is one part of the standard. The others are the APIs. So when we think about Fixius, one way you could solve a problem of data sharing is you could just, you could just aggregate all of that data in a central repository and have companies come to get data and have companies come to deposit data. Could definitely work that way. In the financial services industry, that idea was kind of the first to go. That, that was not gonna succeed because much of the data we're talking about exchanging is financially sensitive. It is you know, businesses uh, account numbers and information that we would not want to centralize and that credential service providers would not want to give up. They wanna have control of that data. So Fixius is built off of point-to-point -point connections. One CSP sharing information with another, logging that information on the shared ledger, that information then being able to, um, to be used and distributed down to the end users so that they can benefit from it. So because of those point-to-point -point connections, the APIs themselves, they are also standardized. So we can't have every, every company saying, I wanna use my, CS, uh, excuse me, my, um, my API. Instead, we are developing um, what we call standardized APIs through a, a partner organization. I think some of the most important things are as well as we get to the next slide around uh, Fixius and what it does and how it establishes interoperability and trust is really what I mentioned about control of data. So in addition to um, having the front end on how do you make sure you're authenticated, how do you not have central, centralized data, all that's important. But on the shared ledger, one of the key things that that capability offers um, the participants of Fixius is updated information. So sharing information is important, but if I've done that point to point, how do I know if that data has ever changed? And I should start using new information and the old data, it should no longer be used. Because we are deploying the platform on the shared ledger um, that, that EY has developed for us, um, we're able to provide that notification to anyone that has a, a, a smart contract with that data so that they can change it. And then the final part is putting a permissions level in Fixius to say um, the customers on the endpoints who are working with their CSPs want to have full control on who they share data with. But it, 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 is, it is essential to everything that we're doing on Fixius. So it is a permission-based platform where businesses can elect to which other companies they wanna share their data with, or, or to all, all companies if they want. But that level of permission, permissioning is also very important uh, to the platform, scalability and adoption moving forward. So with that, uh, kind of in that high level description, I'll let Andy kind of walk us through one of the transactions supported by the platform uh, and give us some insight into how that works. Yeah, sure. Thanks, George. Um, so I'll walk through uh, a couple of the, uh, the flows. Uh, so for end users, the platform is hidden behind a user interface um, provided by what we call a credentialized service provider, which in many cases will be a financial institution. So the end user may be on that website and wanting to transact with a vendor. And so first uh, they're gonna enter a search query to find that vendor. Uh, th that request is gonna be passed on to the Fixius network, um, which provides the results for the user's query, uh, including a directory identifier, a DID. Uh, and, and that is then used to communicate back with the network whenever they want to transact um, with, with that, uh, um, with that particular search query, 
Um, <clears throat> so the Fixius platform, it doesn't store private information, uh, but it simply enables a uh, party and counterparty to connect and transact off platform. So now that we've identified the counterparty, we can move on to the second part of the flow. Uh, for the second flow shown here, the users identified a vendor with which they would like to transact. Uh, and before they can make the request, they'll need to uh, get a token on the Fixius platform. So the user's CSP will initiate the process to get the token generated, uh, which is run through a rules engine smart contract. Uh, the Fixius platform issues a token, which then allows the CSP to get the information that they need to transact. Uh, the counterparty will validate the token to make sure it's authentic and that it applies to the request uh, before providing the info back to the user. So then finally, the originating party is able to come back to the Fixius platform to validate the token and the information, um, which also changes the status and closes it out. And it now also provides a warranty on the information that they've received. Uh, and we can move on to show uh, what happens on the chain with, with these flows. Uh, and I'll hand it back over to George. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Andy. So a um, little bit of risk here. I'm certainly not uh, a technical uh, person on the project. I am product owner uh, at Notcher for Fixius, but uh, rely a lot on, uh, on my technology partners. But I thought for today's meeting, um, because of the audience is um, probably highly technical um, and wanting to know a little more detail on how we are um, leveraging shared ledger or, or blockchain for uh, Fixius, we go into a little more detail on the flow that Andy just walked us through. So he did talk about a, a search capability. And I mentioned that Fixius does not have a central data store. Andy is exactly right. There is some level of data that must be stored in a directory on Fixius so that you can look up the other party in which you want to exchange data with. It's very high level. Um, it's very commonly known data, you know, like a company name or a company address, that, that type of information. Well, in order to get that to, um, to the directory, the first thing that a CSP would do was enter that information and establish that company that they're representing on Fixius. When they do that, they are in fact uh, uh, receiving a unique identifier for that business. The business can give that to other businesses if they choose, um, that ID can be used to make sure I have the right business. If I'm, finding, if I'm looking for a company and there's more than one with the same name or maybe even multiple, more than two, um, I can use this uh, unique identifier to make sure I am looking for the correct uh, company. So that is what we call the DID number. It's directory identifier number. It is unique. It is generated by the platform, cannot be repeated, um, and cannot be removed from the ledger. It will be there even after that business may have been retired and is not using uh, Fixius anymore with their CSP, that DID will still remain uh, obviously on the ledger unchanged. Now, once I've established the DID, then there comes the opportunity for the CSP working with their business to upload that information we talked about. So what is the data that I wanna share? What is that sensitive financial information, maybe contact information that I have at my company? Um, it could be remittance, um, requirements of the data I need to receive when you send me a payment. It has got um, thresholds and all types of data on what we call a profile. When that information is uploaded to the ledger for Fixius, it's not uploaded um, in its natural state, right? In, a, in, a, in a, a readable state. Instead, it is hashed and the hash value is stored on the blockchain. And I'll, I'll get to a minute why that's important. And Andy talked about this um, in the flow, but Having that hash is very important. So you see that on the second line, that, that, that CSP has established a DID on the first line, and now they have, in fact, um, uh, they've uploaded that hash on the second line. So now we have another business who's already done a search, and now they're gonna request that hash information because they want that data. They wanna provide it to their client. So the first thing they're gonna do, as Andy said, they need to get that token that's issued by Fixius. Because remember, without bilateral agreement, I'm going to have someone coming into my API gateway environment that I don't have a contract with. So I need to validate somehow they are a good user, I can provide this data, and I can rely on, on the security. So the first thing they'll do is they'll validate that token or take that token that's been issued um, and make sure that it is a token that's been issued by 
by Fixius. Um, if in fact it is, then they'll skip down to the, to the end um, and they'll um, provide that information back to the, uh, to, to the other CSP. Now, there's some other entry points where they can have a delay. They can have pending because they're waiting to get their permission. But what that token, from token issued, it's actually gonna move to a status that's incorrect on the page, uh, guys, I, I'm, I apologize. That token would actually move to a, a status of consume. So I've gotten the token, I've, I've checked it against, is this a token that's been uh, issued by Fixius? It is, now I can rely on the, day, uh, on the, the request and I'm gonna re return this API call. So um, when I do that, uh, it, it's still in consume. Um, go to the next one, I think, uh, and, and do the next page. Yeah, so maybe I was wrong, guys. Sorry about that. Here, here you see the consumed entry. So the last part that's important that I wanna make sure we cover today, regardless of any other confusion is, that token, that last status that it will have on it will be from the CSP that wanted the data. So the API call has gone out. The message has been returned with an API response. I have all of the data. All of that data we've talked about, the financial information. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hash that data. And if my hash, that algorithm I use, matches the hash that's on the ledger, then I know that data hasn't been tampered with and it's trusted for me to use. Once I do that, I will change the status of the token to verify. That is an important step in Fixius because the receiver of that data now has a warranty from the sender that that, date, that data can be used to, to initiate payments with um, or other use cases that will um, be supported down the road. So that verification or that verified status of that token uh, very important in that last step that, that Andy was uh, mentioning in the flow. You'll see on the screen, there's a couple of others there. I, I would just comment that we're only covering one, uh, what we call exchange service or one API today uh, in this short presentation. Fixius will support um, countless others. Um, we are working through uh, use cases now or, or with our early adopters um, and the companies that will be connecting obviously first to the platform. So we'll, we, we intend to um, support many other uh, uh, data exchange services um, in the near future with the platform. So Andy, I think our next slide, it kind of concludes, if you will, the overview, I think for us today. Um, my time says we have about five to six minutes left. So I'll ask, uh, Andy, Eli, or anyone else who can help, do we have any, any yeah. questions from the audience? Yeah, I think we do. Um, so uh, the first one, George, and I'll, I, I guess I can read it directly to you. It's about, uh, it's about um, client data. It says, Fixius, do we also talk about client data, identity, and whether they pass the AML of one of the participants, or are we limited to the transaction data? That's a good question. So, um, and I'll answer it kind of two ways. So one, the data that you're receiving, uh, uh, if you're connected to the Fixius platform, it, it is trusted, it is warrantied, um, there is, quote, a guarantee with that payment, because in order to be a CSP, I kind of glossed over that a little bit, you really have to pass the test with Nacho, right? So let's think of a great uh, credential service provider. It would certainly be, first of all, a financial institution. They have the most knowledge about the account numbers that belongs to their customers. They own that data. So they can very much validate it and trust it just within their own environment. But there are other companies who do this well um, in addition to banks. Um, and these are the, the larger networks who spend a great deal of time and money to create the technologies and processes to validate the data. So answer one is yes, it is validated data. Um, and so it can be trusted that AML and these kind of things have, have been done. However, I'm not naive enough to think that a business onboarding a new supplier with that data, they might also still require that they go do some additional uh, checks or verifications, right? To make sure that they are complying with their own um, internal processes for things like AML and know your customer. So will there be a need to do those things? I think in the immediate future, I would say yes, depending on um, the situation and, and the data and the business. Uh, but we are looking at other endpoints with Fixius 
of other credential service providers who could provide those services as well. So if you're looking for, let's say a W-9, a copy of a W-9 or, or maybe information about insurance, those kind of things, we're looking at, at providing that data as well, those, those kinds of data elements. Okay. So another, uh, another question I think you probably can answer very quickly, but I think is important just in case it wasn't clear. Um, what about uh, move of liquidity with the payments? So liquidity with the payments. I believe, I believe that's asking, you know, are we, are we, is right now Fixius involved in the actual transfer of value or, or moving, moving the, the, the payment itself? Yeah, okay. I think I understand that too, Elon. So from the elevator pitch to the 20 minutes we spent together, um, I hope you guys walk away as well with, with this understanding. The Fixius platform, even though it is operated by Anansha, right, who operates or who writes the rules for the ACH network, Fixius is not intended to move money. It will not do any settlement. It will not um, have financial transactions. Um, it doesn't have any kind of uh, value exchange in the platform. It is truly a platform dedicated to, and will always be that, to the exchange of payment related information, but not the exchange of payment. So when it comes to liquidity, you know, could one day there be data that's being exchanged to help businesses understand um, liquidity or, finan or, or financing type questions? Yeah, I think, I think I, would, I would say that's a possibility as we think about things with factoring and those kind of things where data is needed to make decisions. But Eli's right. The actual settlement of movement of money is out of scope uh, for the Fixius platform. And I, I think we hope we have time for one more. I, it's sort of, I can I'm a lob out two and they're sort of combined. They're from the same person. Um, would CSPs own their own nodes on the network? And is there a requirement for all CSPs to be on the same cloud platform that Nasha uses? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a technical one. Um, so I'll do my best at it. So I think the, the short answer is yes. Every CSP will have their own copy of the share loader and so be re required to host their own node. Now, Nacha, in cooperation with Ernst & Young, or EY, excuse me, um, is also providing options for that. So, Nacha could provide a software as a service to a CSP, and we can host that node in their environment, uh, but certainly not a requirement but th that we host that. But it is a requirement that each CSP have its own node. Um, now, that is also related to, is there a particular cloud service? Um, our, our first version, MVP, if you will, of Fixius is it runs in the Azure cloud. Um, and that is what we are supporting uh, day one. And that would be in May. Now, we are already have plans uh, later this year to support the other cloud environments. Um, I don't know, Andy and Eli probably even know more about this than me, but obviously looking at, um, at whether it be Amazon, um, or Google or whatever other cloud environment, we believe we can run in any of those, but we chose Azure for a number of reasons um, for, for the initial release. Yep, that's right. And, and um, so we have designed it in such a way that it can be cloud agnostic. So we're not tying it to any particular proprietary technology that's offered by any one cloud provider and any of the provisioning scripts that, that we're working on uh, or the containerization should be able to be used at other clouds. So I think we are right at time, which is great. Um, good, good job, everyone. Um, and if anyone has any further questions or wants to talk about this further or hear more about it, you can reach out to any of the three of us.